week's voice party is brought to you by IOPvideo.com. We're all stuck inside and content is king right now. So if you want to create some content, have some video shot, advertise your small business, start a podcast, whatever, check out IOPvideo.com. We do it all and we will do it all for you. IOPvideo.com. We make things look pretty. For our listeners at home, allow me to introduce... Minister Wanda Johnson, please introduce yourself to our listeners and tell our listeners what it is that you do. Thank you so much for the invite. My name is Wanda Johnson. I am the mother of Oscar Grant, who was killed January 1st, 2009 at the Fruitvale BART station. Um, I am happy to have another daughter and two wonderful grandchildren. Um, It is good to be able to be on the line with you today to talk probably about what's going on in our world today. So again, I am the mother of Wanda Johnson. I'm the son, I'm the mother of Oscar Grant, and I'm happy to be on the line with you guys today. Yeah, well, we're, we're happy glad to have you. Have you. Yeah, no, it's it's an honor, and uh, we appreciate your time because I know, like you said, with everything that's going on right right now, I'm sure you're a very busy woman. A lot of people, I'm sure, are coming to you. Yeah, I, I don't know if that's you know. Can you talk about? Um, that? You're absolutely, actually, hundred percent right. Um, I've actually been starting my day off about four or five in the morning. Um, I have been. Uh, interviewing with um, people from the UK and just all over the world. Um, I actually um, started my day off pretty early today, uh, did an interview with CNN and wow. um, interview with the Wall Street Journal, uh, an interview. So I've had several interviews on today, um, several interviews yesterday, just Every day it has been a lot of interviews, um, and plus the Oscar Grant Foundation, we actually hold our own town hall sessions. And so uh, on Saturday of last week, we held um, a panel session, which we had Attorney John Burris on our panel session. We had Judge Glenda Hatchett, um, who has her own uh, TV show, um, we had a uh, Commonwealth Stephanie Morales, who is a Commonwealth attorney in Virginia, and we had a retired NYPD officer. And so we discussed the climate of what's going on today and what some of the expectations um, we look forward to seeing and we can expect. And so it's been pretty busy. I have a a busy schedule tomorrow as well. I'm going to go out to one of the protests and speak at a protest and and do a few other things as well. So it's been busy, quite busy. The time to be with I, us. I can only... Right, yeah, no, I appreciate so you yeah, taking the time because it uh, aside from you know you're you've been busy and you've been involved with everything that's going on you know on a on a on a personal level it's got to be hard with everything going on and 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 you experience this on a very personal level and you kind of relive it i'm sure it, it that's so that i admire you for that because that's that's got to be uh, a lot to deal with you know it is very hard to deal with um when george floyd was first killed um i was two days of unrest two days of really not sleeping and it Mm -hmm. really brought back what happened not that i forgot it but it really just opened it up again to um just an unbearable hurt because our society um has on our currency in God we trust. And right. 
if we really truly believe what's on our currency, then we would also know that it tells us that we are to love our brother, which could be our neighbor, the person we don't even know as we love ourselves. And so because George was laying there pleading and begging for help, and yet those who are hard to protect and serve ignored his plea of cry, it reminded me of where is America's compassion and love for one another. And what I took from that, watching that video, is that apparently we don't really know and understand what love is. We don't understand what having compassion for our brother and sister is. And our brother and sister does not have to be uh, related to just one uh, nationality, but our brother and sister can cross lines and be of any nationality. And so, right. you know, just seeing that really broke me in such a, just a profound way, it just broke my heart to see that. And it reminded me, you know, too, of the words that Malcolm X once said. He said, are we so blind with patriotism that we cannot see wrong is wrong and right is right. And I say that because we have been so worried about the flag that we have forgotten about the human life. And so we have to get back to a place where we are loving one another as God created us to. I was um, looking on the on the Oscar Grant Foundation uh, website that you um, you have you you do uh, what is it like workshops with with police? Is that am I on the right track? So what we're trying to do is what we call sensitivity training, which mm -hmm. will allow us to go into different police stations and share the story of what happened with Oscar and work with the officers to get them to think before they pull the trigger. Now, we understand that officers, when they go into that police academy, they are hired to protect and serve, as said, or they're hired to serve, right? And so in their training, their training, they're taught to shoot to kill. And so we want officers to de-escalate situations instead of escalating. And so you say, well, how, what do you mean by officers escalating situations? In Oscar's killing, the officer who was the first called officer onto the platform was acting so out of control and so aggressive instead of trying to determine and assess the situation and find out what's going on he instigated and he um did not use self-control and caused a greater um escalation than should have been caused, which that I believe that is what contributed to my son being killed. Um, so you said it's called sensitivity training. Yes, it is. And is it that only? Is that primarily happening in California, or or have they moved it to other? Have you gone to other states? Um, I have not went to other states in that, but I have been to. I was just in. Uh, Minneapolis in November, talking to, on a panel, talking to the community about uh, what 
should take place not only in uh, Minneapolis where George was killed at, but also mm -hmm. throughout the states. And one of the things that we know that is if there is a greater sense of accountability, then we may decrease the incidents that we're having. So just looking at George's, uh, George Floyd's um, situation, the officer who uh, had him pinned down had already several complaints. Matter of fact, they said about 18 complaints. Mm -hmm. okay. Wow. Had the human resource department or the sergeant or the sheriff been doing their job, they would have realized that he had been involved in two other killings, that he had been involved in multiple complaints against him, and they could have took some action to relieve him of his duties or change his position to a desk job, um, something to that effect. But they ignored his current performance and they allowed him to continue to uh, patrol the streets. And from that, he was able to kill another individual. And wow. we, we talk about accountability, saying that uh, our judicial system or our policing system needs to be tore down and rebuilt. Because if you understand the po the history of policing, you will find out that when the police station was formed, it was formed as a control measure, and it was to control uh, African Americans. And it, it goes back to hundreds of years ago when African Americans was brought over here as slaves. And then um, when slavery was abolished um, and policing start, started and was instituted, that is when um, you find that the many members of the Ku Klux Klan moved into the policing uh, department, which caused um, the killing of many uh, African Americans that we don't even know about. Are you able to put in words what this what this uh, rebuilding of, of what the police would look like? Or, I mean, are you able to, yeah, are you able to put it in words what it would look like? So if I had to say, and if I had to put in words the rebuilding of the system, we would look at first how the Police officers have a different set of bill of rights than the than the citizens um, than you and I have. They have a totally different bill of rights. So we will talk about um, removing their bill of rights and having one bill of rights for community as well as policing. We would then remove that, and we would look at how the police union is set up and work to rebuild how that is set up with dealing with hiring practices. Because if you look at the hiring practices of police officers, you can almost become a Barbara in the same amount of time as you become a police officer in some states. In some states, it doesn't require you to have a um, master's degree or a, a bachelor's degree or a, a, a degree in psychology but yet you can get out of high school and sign up for the academy go to the academy and do your 6 to 12 weeks of training and then come out on the field and uh, do patrol duty with the police officer we would say that none of that's acceptable we would say that that could that candidate would have to go into that community where he's going to serve or she's going to serve. And when they're in that community, they will do some community service. They will get to know the people who they are patrolling because oftentimes officers go into a neighborhood that they're not familiar with. They don't know the people there. 
they do not live in the neighborhood so they um just go in with the uh information they have heard concerning that community and so we would change all that as well and so there's just a whole list of things that we would change when we talk about rebuilding the police force um even from the 911 calls that they get you know we're seeing too many people who are being killed that have um some kind of mental challenge and so instead of calling the police for a mental challenge, they would dispatch a certain set of trained professionals in the mental health field. And this will help eliminate them uh, killing those patients that are facing mental health challenges. So, I mean, I could talk to you for another eight hours and that's not really what <laughs> we want to do, right? What is what so, is the what is the pushback like, and, and who is it coming from uh, to get these reforms? So the police don't want change. They, yeah. they they like the way they currently patrol. They like the way they currently really. If they kill someone, they don't they don't miss a paycheck. They go home with paid leave. Um, if they are on administrative duty, they get paid for it. So there's a lot of kickback because you're saying that an officer can, uh, is not going to be given that permission to lie like they have lied in the past. Like when the officer who killed Oscar, one of the officers who was on site, he said when the uh, when the officer who shot and killed Oscar, the other officer said that he didn't even hear the gunshot. Wow. And he was right there. And so he was able to uh, lie on oath, under oath, several of them. And there's really no reprimand for them lying on earth, you know, on under oath. And so my belief now is that for some of the officers who killed George Floyd, I don't think all of them, they might be in jail now. They will probably, if they have not already bailed, because the police union will pay for their bail. And I believe a few of them that are off uh, will be reinstated in another city and receive back pay for the wages they have lost. So... And, and they don't want to do that. They have been comfortable with how they have been performing that they don't want to change that. So most, yeah, talking, talking about the, uh, you were talking about how the, the system itself is flawed. Uh, I think one of the biggest issues with our whole criminal justice system is that it's a for-profit system. There are private prisons that are for-profit that have quotas they need to meet in order to stay in business. And I think criminal justice should, why is that a for-profit industry? Like, that just seems mind-boggling to me because then you're breeding this whole culture of, of prejudice and and discrimination because you have these quotas you have to meet these prisons have to stay in business you're, you're in, at that point you're encouraging people to pull up false charges just so they can meet their quota and correct me if i'm wrong but if i'm not mistaken there's a lot of free labor coming out of prisons these days Absolutely. I've, I've heard stories about people going out and, and essentially fighting forest fires who are prisoners and once they're free they're not allowed to apply to become a fireman because it's like well you were in jail Absolutely. Me. That is 100% correct. And not only do they have the fire camp where they send those um, prisoners to go fight the fires, um, they also have the different industrials, uh, your license plate, some of your genes. That's all in prison made, right? And so those mm -hmm, guys yeah. are making a dollar thirty-five an hour, a dollar fifteen an hour, and what it is is really slave labor. So we left slavery in a physical sense, we think, we say, and we have moved slavery to a 
prison industrial, which will still have you enslaved in a sense because you're not able to do as you would like to do and roam around the city. And so slavery has just transferred into the prison system. And so you always have to kind of look at the tide and look at the situation. So you, the population of African American that's in prison is, you know, higher in any rate. Stop and frisk. You're stopping African Americans at a higher rate with the intent of hoping that they have, you know, some kind of charge already so that they could violate them because once you're a lot of times on the probation or felony probation status, it's very hard to get off because you can't find a job, you can't find housing, you know, there's, you can't uh, get scholarships for college. Uh, sometimes they won't even let you have general aid or financial, I mean, or either um, welfare assistance. And so it's a spiral which oftentimes causes it to be a, a rotating, a rotation of you get out and then you go back in, you get out, you go back in, it's, it becomes a cycle. Yeah. You know, it, it's like I, I have a friend who uh, hasn't committed any crime in a decade, but uh, because of a stipulation, if he's as long as he's had a prior warrant or something, a cop can pull him over and then slam him back in the slammer just for having content contact with a police officer. Guy's got three kids in his 30s and he just can't get any rest. And that's exactly the truth. And that's why, you know, even working to change the law of allowing uh, those who are in prison the opportunity to vote when they get out because their vote has not been counted and they have not been able to vote. So our society has a great deal of work that it has to do on changing the laws of our judicial system. When... Um I, I gotta ask you. It, it it's it's sad to say, but with like a lot of these cases, like George Floyd or or Oscar, if it wasn't for the community, I mean, is it fair to say that if it wasn't for the community doing what they did, these officers would have probably still been working? I would say yes. If there was no cameras with Oscars, definitely mm -hmm. they would have called that justifiable, and it would have been a wrap. But because of the media, and I always say, if you got a phone, lift it up. And then as you lift it up, when you see injustices, begin to tape it. And that's so be the, and that's go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. And so because of the cameras and the uproar of the communities, the officers were charged. And that's the same with what happened with the Oscars case. Um, when, when in the what is it, I think the eighties and nineties when the whole uh, war on drugs was 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 hitting communities hard, do you know if there were people that were able to to see it coming, to see that uh, you know a campaign of war on drugs was going to to basically uh, destroy the neighborhoods with people of color? Do you know if people? Uh um, I, I know that uh, for the war on drugs, if you look at it, the crack cocaine, um, was usually put into the streets. And so when it started affecting the Caucasian nationality um, diversion programs and drug rehabil drug rehabilitation programs was set up. And so if it was a black person or a white person, the judge was more likely to give the white person the opportunity to go to the a drug rehabilitation center and the black person would go to prison and serve 
um, an 18 to a 24 month sentence. And so that the, the drug war was put out so that um, African Americans be could be imprisoned and the quota that you talked about would be set. And because the quota is set, the industry are making money um, by paying hardly anything for the labor that is being done to produce the goods and services of those companies. I, I want to I wanna ask you, um about something a little different now i just i'm curious because I, I you know i've seen fruitvale station a couple of times and uh i i just uh want to have you know i want to hear from you directly how was oscar like i've always been curious so i always say this to to everybody that i talk to whether oscar was good or bad before this incident happened you always got to remember that number one the officer did not know Oscar. he didn't know if oscar had a record or if oscar didn't have a record right yeah and so because of that all that is irrelevant right, right. so but to answer your question i always tell people if you study the bible there's a scripture in romans I believe it's Romans 3.23 that says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, what do you mean, Wanda? Well, if we look in our own backyards, there may be some things that we may find that's uh, not favorable, but maybe the community doesn't know about it, right? Right. And so mm -hmm. because the community doesn't know about it, it's okay. But... I always say this, we always we all have a maker to go before. And so because I believe that Oscar knew the Lord has his personal savior, mm -hmm. I believe also that Oscar made peace with God before his transition, that he'll be with God. And so I say that to say that again, and, and I'll start back at my original statement that you cannot make a an assumption because you see an African American person and decide to become that judge, juror, and executioner, and think that it's okay because ten years five years one year ago that person did something that our society says is illegal or is not illegal right uh, can i share something really quickly when um when the movie came out i was in film school and my and my liberal mm -hmm. teacher i remember i hadn't i didn't see the movie back then uh anyways he said he said he went to see it and that he regretted that the tone that the movie takes is that is that Oscar is trying to 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 make his life better. He said, "Why why couldn't we just have a movie where it's it's somebody who who I guess I don't know is is, is whoever Oscar Grant he thought was." And, and at the time when I heard him say it, I was like, you know what? He makes a good point. Like it would be more realistic to have a character that's not trying to 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 redeem his life. But you know, I saw the movie. Uh, yeah, well, but, but, but see, 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 I wanted that part in there because you know mm -hmm. why? Because as America, we pretend that we are all good. You can be on Wall Street and you could do the stock market and you can, like Emory. Right? They wiped all those people out all that money with their stocks. And you guys might be too young to know about it. But you, you can uh-huh. You can Oh yeah, I remember them. Oh, okay. Remember you can portray that 
everything is right in our lives, right? But if you really look at America and you look at the situation that many African American, Hispanic, even Caucasian young men go through at a per- in a period of their lives, right? And they're faced with all kind of decisions. And so oftentimes, even though Caucasian young men or women have done things, it's less likely to be known about, right? Because the chances of you and I going, the chances of a Caucasian and a black person going to jail, 90% is going to be the black person and maybe 10% the Caucasian person. You know, um, a story was just shared with me the other day about an officer. It was two officers. One was white and one was black. And they were on the beat together. And they did 12 stops. So, because it was toward the end of the month where they got to get their quota. So the white officer, he stopped. 11 African-Americans and he gave them tickets for whatever reason. And so on his 12th stop, it was a Caucasian young man. And he said, young man, have a good day. Don't speed anymore. And the other officer who was there, who was black, he says, you have given all the black people a ticket but now you for doing the same thing that this caucasian guy is doing but for whatever reason you're saying you're going to let the caucasian guy know go and so the black officer wrote the caucasian guy a ticket because he said in that fair is fair if you're going to do it against one you're going to do it against them all you're going to be fair across the board. And that's where you think about the injustices that we face in America. Do you think the, the current political climate, you know, has made this this uh, in this type of issue worse? Or do you think it's just it's just the cameras are around now? You know, because I know that since the current administration has been in, there's it seems like the divide has gotten worse. I could be wrong. <laughs> well, well, the, it's, you know what? If the head is rotten, the rock's going to tinkle down. It's just mm-hmm. like you have a basket of fruit, right? If you have a basket of fruit and one fruit has a fruit on it, and that fruit stays in the basket, what happens? The whole yep. the whole fruit basket becomes open. If you've got a head that's rotten, I'm, so, I'm sorry, could, the rock I couldn't hear that. Down, yeah. And the whole force could be come up. So the saying is, one bad apple will the whole bunch. And it's the truth. Anytime you have a president that says, if they loot, we shoot. <laughs> yeah. That's a problem. Yeah. Yeah, it was it uh, Chris Rock had a stand special a few years ago. And he had a bit in there where he was talking about the, the police brutality that's going on. And how people use that excuse, oh, it's just a few bad apples. It's not the whole thing. And he brought up a good point where he was saying, look, some some careers can't afford to have bad apples. You know, American Airlines can't be like most of our pilots like to land. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It, it, I got to. Uh, so ever, ever, you know, since you've been in, involved as, as, as you have, you have the, the Oscar Grant Foundation. Uh, just for example, like, I just wanted, I'm curious, have you talked to the George Floyd family or any other families that have been affected with the same issue, with the same incident that you had with Oscar? So every year we do a Oscar Grant Legacy Weekend mm-hmm. and mothers from across the country, they come. Um, have I talked to them? I've talked to them probably weekly. Um, Tamir Rice, uh, who was killed in Ohio, 
he was 13 by an Ohio police officer. They said he was playing with a toy gun in the park, and they shot him dead. Um, uh, his mother is Samaria Rice. So, yes, I talked to all uh, Trayvon Martin's mom, Eric Gardner's mom, Michael Brown's mom, Sandra Bland's mom. Um, so, yes, I talk with all of them frequently. Um, we host events here, and they come to the events, and vice versa. Yeah, the reason I ask is because if, if someone, you know, because uh, for some for these cases that you mentioned, you know, luckily they were on the in the in the limelight and, and, and there was eyes on, on them as far as cameras go. So I'm sure there's been cases. I can't even imagine how many cases of this that went unrecorded and when, you know, they got they got away with it. So I'm just curious. the reason I bring it up is because if, you know, you guys offer help for people who, who may want to contact you for that absolutely um and and if they like me like protesting or advice like that uh my my, my brother uh he also has a foundation that he works with um helping them like set up different protests helping them with rallies and things of that nature Okay. This um, Oscar happened before the. I'll just I, based on the information that I that I saw on the internet. Um, I mean, Oscar happened before the Black Lives Matter movement started. Do you, do you think he was a big part of, you know, what happened so, to him? So, so really, Alicia Garza, who was one of the founders of the Black Lives Matter, right? When Oscar was killed, she was out there protesting. Wow. So the Black Lives Matter matter actually started then mm. however it didn't get really recognized until uh trayvon martin but they were present during um the Os when oscar grant was killed during the protests and movement for oscar grant okay all right what i another question i have for you that i was just I, you know as a as a as a mother and I was when you gave when you gave them permission uh was it Ryan to, to make the film did you did you have uh did you worry that you know did you have any doubts huh. about allowing someone to to make a film and and how essentially you're handing over the legacy of what he was going to be remembered for um absolutely um that's why we were very involved in the film oh good good um I'm actually in the movie oh really Mm hmm so um when they was filming i was there my uh my brother and his wife was there um they would i met with octavia met with ryan met with michael b mm. um gave opinions and shared some stories about oscar and so, yes, yeah, so we were a very integral part of that movie. I actually have a role in that movie. Um, and so I was satisfied with the outcome of the movie. It's a very, uh, you know, it, it's a very wonderful movie. And of, of course, you know, I, I watching it, I know how it how it's going to unfortunately end. It, it, it gives you a sense of. Uh, of, of I, it almost like you forget that you're watching a movie about who it is about and, and it gives you a sense of hope that everything's gonna you know as movies usually do uh, so i'm i just I, i've always been curious as as you know for families that have had their 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 stories portrayed on film i didn't you know i so you were very involved and you had a role in the film i, I had no idea um I, I, do you still Ever since this happened, what have you had any kind of uh, I want to say a relationship or or with with uh, with the Bart Police Department? So right now we host our visuals every year at the Bart Station. Okay. Um, they actually have come out. Um, I'm actually uh, an acquaintance of one of the 
uh, employees who does the interviewing for police officers for the park station. So she's very much involved with the police department and um, her and I talk all the time. Um, they just changed police chiefs again, but I do usually go meet the chief and we talk and um, they always say if there's anything I need to, you know, contact them. But we do have a relationship where we talk. We've hosted events and we've invited, you know, the police from the BART and they have attended. So um, it's about bridging the gap between our youth and our communities mm -hmm. um, and policing. I have a question about the about the protests going on. Do you worry that um, that that the protests might get hijacked? Like I'm I'm seeing a lot of these ads about. It is already in in a sense some of it is already hijacked. Mm. Um, people from out of state are doing some of that stuff, and not only are people out of state, but also. Uh, infiltrate whoever the police put involved in those protests uh, is doing that as well. What about so, in terms of, of philosophy? Like, for example, um, I'm, I'm seeing ads the, for, uh, by Joe Biden, which uh, personally to me, it, it feels a little bit um, not not honest uh, for 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 it's generous. We, yeah, for for a presidential candidate to be saying, I also feel bad for this vote for me. In, in terms of philosophy, do you feel it, 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 it's being hijacked? Oh, absolutely. But I stand on what Dr. King said. He said that a riot is the language of an unheard. And so because America has not been hearing the conversation that uh, Black Lives Matter, and until America hears that conversation and sits down and deal with it, um, you'll find that riots will still occur and there'll be those individuals who'll be trying to capitalize off of these riots that's occurring. Yeah, because I think over the years we've had, you know, uh, Trayvon Martin and Eric Garnier and all these incidences, one after another after another. And there's been so many of them that I think as a society, we've all just in a way kind of gotten numb to them because it's just so many and so frequent. And it feels like this is finally like the straw that broke the camel's back where everybody just kind of rose up and said enough. Because when you're looking at these protests and the people posting Black Lives Matter, it's not just people of color, it's people of all colors. It's whites, Hispanics, Asians, Latinos, everybody is like united in their outrage right now over how bad things have gotten, how bad people are being treated. So, uh, yeah, the protests are getting hijacked, but when you look, it's people are united in their their outrage over what's happened. That is correct. You know, what? what? That, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> I, I was, you know, I was, I was, I was going to agree with what what Phil was saying. What what worries me is reports, be, you know, you know of. Um, when I when you say infiltration hijack in an in, in example, I've heard about white supremacist groups uh, sneaking in and actually, uh, you know, engaging in looting because they're thinking, oh, I'm going to make these protesters look bad as and, you know, and, and that kind of, you know, I mean, if, if it serves a greater good to get people to listen, then even ironically so then great. But I do lift up my eyebrow at that kind of stuff because. You know, it's it's completely. I mean, the whole thing is just a a mess when they start getting involved. Was, in, infil you know, was yeah. infiltration um, something that was happening uh, during the 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 sixties um, protests? I'm sure it was. More so, I know for sure. Um, the last few protests that has been happened that it has happened. I do. I do want to share. Uh, there's this book that I read uh, about a year ago called um, "White Fragility," which, honestly, I, if we could, I would love to do an episode on 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 that book. Anyways, it talks about how uh, you know you had racism, you had overt racism, 
and then after the 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 civil rights movement racism didn't go away even though at least i i don't I, in fact i think we all believe that, that at least it, it it changed right um but what the book says is that it, it goes it went underground after that and mm. so you couldn't kick people out of your restaurant for being black for example but things like like incarcerate you know incarceration or, or other types of racism were still there uh economic inequality and so one of my concerns with what's going on right now is that because it's so popular because it has so many people involved in it that i i worry that the same thing will happen where you know instead right. of actually having real change and real uh change in 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 systems that we'll end up having the same thing because you know um at the end of the day we're people uh we're people and and even if our technology has gotten so much better uh we still have a lot of the same flaws and so yeah i worry that that racism will again go underground in a different way obviously right yeah where it's more it's not it's not just uh uh like a very you know how they it was before like you said and now it's more systemic yeah i, I mean it already was systemic but oh well here's what the, what it says right where it's like racism is uh, uh black people making up less than 20 percent of the population but i think something like 60 percent of the prison population and you know when you look at uh, uh, uh rates of gra graduating high school or rates of, of college college uh education uh when you look at um uh the life expectancy that's that's when you see what racism really is and so like it, it it would be naive to think that all these protests are going to change all of that right like right yeah all of that will well, well the, the the other thing to keep in mind is this isn't the first time protests like this have gone on i mean look back at the 90s with the la riots over there those cops beating the shit out of rodney yeah. king and that was 30 yeah. years ago and, and i think when you when with hindsight it's like oh things actually got worse after that it, well, it got worse, what, but what I, I think what what did what it's happening now, especially with, I don't think, for the most part, that they realize, you know, that that having all these eyes on them, like the the cameras. I mean, look at look at Arizona; they just passed the law that it's now going to be illegal for you to record the cops. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, and I don't think they anticipated this much from technology being available like they didn't anticipate you know like oh i don't think they planned for that yeah I mean, you know like it's just something that happened and they're like oops you know we let and now it's like you let the monkey out of the box you can't get it back in now, but there is you know people go ahead no go ahead go ahead well there is precedence for for example when you think of the 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 vietnam war uh, people went crazy over the Vietnam War because because it was it was televised, right? Or or at least there was a lot of coverage of it. But then right. subsequent wars were not covered like that, and so we did have a technology to expose uh, uh, things that were wrong with society. But then after that, instead of instead of the world getting better, uh, basically the government or you know people in charge just figure out how to make it so that that technology did not continue exposing things that were wrong. I got I got a question for you guys with uh, as far as those uh, not not to go off topic but uh, you you touched on this earlier Gaspar. I don't know if you saw the the the, uh, the pictures of those politicians that went out to protest and they took a knee. Uh, fucking hypocrites, dude. Well, yeah, what do you guys think of that? Cuz I just saw Well, there, there was a meme that said it. There was a meme that said it like Colin Kaepernick can't change the law. So his only choice is to use this platform to kneel down because there's millions of people watching him. If you're a politician, you, you, you're you're part of the system. You don't need to kneel down, you know? Right. That's Yeah, yeah, you are the rule makers. Yeah, like who are you kneeling for? For our listeners at home who um, are just sitting on the couches or driving their car, listening to our podcast, what can the average person do? in the face of this police terror, I mean, just call it what it is. Um, what would you recommend for our average listener who wants to get involved to do, you know? What would you, what would you say to them? Well, it's important to know 
if you're vote if you're a voter if you're not one you should become one and in the voting process you should know who to vote for um and to ensure it's not um a district attorney who's going to take uh the money from police because then when making judgments or making decisions uh it could easily lead that district attorney to sway towards the police and so you have to know who you're voting for you have to become and get when you're selected to become jurors it's important to get on the jury panel and become a jury uh panelist um get involved, go to your local council meetings by either way of Zoom, uh, by going in person when they have it, to find out what's going on in your communities and get involved. Don't just sit and wait till it knocks on your door, but you can move and do something before it even knocks on your door by getting involved with the community and finding out the stats of the community. So for example, if you're uh, from Richmond, you need to know how much that city is putting into policing, into community uh, services, into housing. And if you find out that the uh, majority of the funding is going to policing and you know very little going into housing or social services then you may want to get a petition started to try to defund the police to get some of those funds reallocated to those different categories i, I don't know if you have you I, I don't know if we talked about this yesterday but we did mention uh that uh, th there was an article released that Richmond's actually starting to defund the police. I don't know if you, if you, I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Say it that again. The, the mayor of Richmond, uh, is he, I guess he started to pass a bill to defund the police. I don't know if you, if you were aware of that. That That's good because you want to have, it's not saying that when you hear defunding, it's not meaning that you're going to shut the police force down. What it means is you're going to take you're going to take some of the funds that is being allocated to policing and reallocate those funds into community service and housing. This way, it will give the uh, residents of that particular city to be able to uh, get more better jobs or get jobs, um, get housing uh get social service uh things that they may need at a lesser value than what they currently are getting it do you think right now many of the cities are putting the majority of their funds into policing mm. which if you defund the police and reallocate those maybe our youth will uh, stay in school. There will be different programs that could be offered uh, towards the youth. Do you think there's room uh, in in what's going on to also to also make people aware of, of you know cutting back on on the prisons on you know making them smaller, less less prisoners, things like that. Now uh, that I have not heard of that uh, they're going to make less prisons. Uh, I haven't heard of that. So I really can't speak uh, to that because I'm not knowledgeable in that area. When you talk about mass incarceration, uh, there is, what, 60% of the uh, inmates who are in prison uh, being African American versus other nationalities, um, why is that? Because of the mass incarceration that's going on to um, be able to capitalize 
on the prison industrial system by already have the prisoners in place where you do not have to pay them a high wage. You may pay a dollar and something per hour for their services. And um, I don't I, I don't think there is even a, a reduction of prisoners in mind. Now, I know that they have um, changed the way supposedly that some of the prisoners have been sentenced, but I'm not, you know, I, I, I don't know the whole spectrum of the um, reducing the prison. Is there, uh, aside from, you know, I have a a friend who I talked to who actually has been to some of your events. He's a teacher at Richmond High. And um, he had a question that he, you know, he, he wanted to know um, what what is the educator, a teacher's role in, uh, in preventing police violence and in supporting with the aftermath? What is the educator's yeah, role? Like a, well, a teacher, one of the educators, one of the educator roles should be to teach black history. And currently we don't we don't offer that in schools okay so how can you expect people to know where they come from if they have no idea because it's not being taught to them so um it would be good to have some black history courses so that um our youth could get an understanding of first where um they came from or where their forefathers came mm -hmm. from and the struggles that they went through. And that would help our youth who are growing up to be adults know the struggles that their forefathers went through and what action they should be taking to ensure that they don't have to go through those same struggles. And so it has to be taught. It, it, it's, it's some course that has to be offered. So all, all four of us are, are filmmakers in one way or another. Do you think that as filmmakers, um, would you say the same thing as you would to, to teach her how? Well, yeah, same question, but for filmmakers. Absolutely. Um, you, you have to know um, the statistics, know what's going on in the community. African American people and begin to share that so others will know as well the struggles and the things that can help um, African Americans or myself overcome the struggles that you know I face that we face. You know, and I think as filmmakers, we we have a responsibility to um, each and every filmmaker has an instant response uh, to the world, which is essentially to show a version of the world or some sort of point about the world that they, uh, that they believe it is. However we think the world is, we want to, or how we'd like the world to be. And I think um, there, there is also a responsibility to put one's truth in it. And um, not just one's truth, but the truth, if you can tap into it. And it's definitely something that I, I would like to tackle. Like I, I have a few film ideas, um, not just with black history, but even with what's going on now. And I, I have to talk to my fellow filmmakers after this interview is over off the air so they don't steal them. But I wanted to ask you uh, to, to move things back to Oscar for a quick second. I meant to ask way earlier in the beginning of the interview, but um, I remember for me, um, what it felt like uh, for the first time to chant uh, "We are all Oscar Grant." Um, it as a as a young black male, it made me feel um, empowered. It also made me wary, you know, knowing that it could have been me. It could have been anyone that I knew in that situation, regardless of what we were doing. But I wanted to ask you how you felt about um, Oscar becoming uh, a symbol for for the for a movement 
um, I think it, it it bears asking. And how, how did you how did you feel about that? Um, it's it's actually um, something spiritual for me because um, I believe that Oscar and I was going to be in ministry together. Mm. I believe the Lord told me that Oscar would go through some things in his life, but that he would overcome those things. And from that, he would be able to share with the world, you know, the very things that he went through, but to let them know that you can overcome it. And so I believe that God has showed myself that we would be in ministry together. And uh, one day I was crying because it wasn't like I had envisioned that it was going to be and the Lord began to show me and tell me to look around that even though he's physically not here he's still speaking and so we are in ministry together so I am you know very proud of uh, even though he's not here uh, his success in reaching a world um, you know all across the four different seats. So I I feel you know empowered uh, when people do say I am Oscar Grant because in reality it could have been them. And um, also earlier in the interview, uh, JD had asked you what Oscar is really like, and I, I don't think I've ever share this with JD um, but I I remember um, you know as far as like not just watching the when I saw the film the last time I saw Oscar stuck out to me and it was um, it was over at, uh, at Aunt Bonnie's house and you know uh, Tatiana was there and you know another cousin was there and we were playing the Wii and what have you. And then I, if I remember correctly, you had picked me up and you were going to drop me off and uh, you had Tatiana with us and then you picked up Oscar. I got to see Oscar interact with Tatiana the first time that day. And I remember my heart just melting because here was a man who obviously adored his daughter and um that was that was an image that i will never forget and there's a scene in the movie that um that got me that really got me i mean all this all the whole entire movie fruitvale got me but there's a scene that hits home uh when he's brushing his teeth you know michael b jordan is brushing his teeth with um the little actress playing tatiana and i had a similar moment actually more than one moment you know i have folks in this podcast know i, I have a godchild goddaughter specifically and when she was in first grade i came over one morning i was invited for breakfast and uh she hadn't brushed her teeth yet and she asked me she was like god dad will you will you brush your teeth with me and that just became a thing after that you know if i came over early enough she just oh will you brush your teeth with me i was like sure kiddo that's fine and it 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 just made me think about that that scene and i always and every time i interact with my god kid i always think about Oscar's interactions with, uh, with with uh, Tatiana, and it it just I'm not going to say that. Um, I mean, it, I I will say that it definitely um, gave me perspective on my role as a godfather, and hopefully my future role as a father um, to my own child, and and that's something that I hold dear in my heart. You know, my memories of Oscar, such that they are. Um, that's a beautiful memory. Uh, I, 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 uh, I have a question, uh, as far as, you know, to, to any, uh, any person who is, you know, on the brink of becoming a law officer, is there a law enforcement officer? Is there any message you have for them? Yes. Number one, do not fall into the trap of following your leader, especially if they're doing wrong um, and you know the work ethics of what they're doing or how they're performing their job is incorrect. 
do not follow them. Number one, work to de-escalate situations and escalating the situations. Um, that's why it's so important for um, officers to do community service first in the communities where they're going to protect and serve because this way they'll get an opportunity to get to know the community of people that they're dealing with and when you become familiar with an area you usually can handle it and you handle it differently when you have to intervene in such a way that um, you have to arrest a person or something to that effect and so they need to really learn the uh, neighborhood that they're patrolling. And if they're racist, don't join the force because the force is not for mm -hmm. you. Uh, and the last thing that I would say is make sure that your training is a right and accurate training versus just that six weeks, but really learn uh, people so that when you have to make split decisions, you or you just don't re overact and make the split decisions unnecessary. Okay. Um, one thing I wanted to ask is uh, we've seen protests in response to police brutality a lot over the years, but with what's going on right now, it just it feels different. And it going back to what we were saying earlier, it kind of feels like, you know, the unity of all these people of all these different colors are united in their outrage over what happens. Do you think that that unity might finally be a vessel to bring about this systemic change that we desperately need in our criminal justice system? Do you think this is finally going to be the straw that breaks the camel's back? Um, I think the unity is just the beginning. Um, we can march all we want to and protest all we want to. But when the smoke clears, the question becomes, do we have laws and um, procedure changes that have taken effect? Because that's the end result. And are the officers being held accountable for their actions? Yeah, that's, uh, accountability is definitely uh, a big one because you hear some of these stories about what's happening. You know, someone goes into somebody else's house and kills them in their own home. Oh, I thought it was my house and they were trespassing. And somehow yeah. that flies or someone's face down on a BART platform complying and they get shot. Oh, I, I thought I had my taser. I didn't know it was my pistol. He was face down complying. Why would you tase him? And yet somehow those excuses are perfectly justifiable. And Or even just how even even during the, the current state of protests now, you, I've, I've heard stories of uh, police, entire police offices uh, coming out in front of the cameras and saying, oh, we're going to protest with these people and we're going to join in because we don't approve of what happened with that officer over in Minneapolis. And then as soon as uh, the, the cameras are gone, as soon as the news people are gone, they're beating the soup out of the protesters. I mean, I'm, I've heard that that's not every single case, but the fact that even one case is like that, it, it's too many. It's too much. You know, they're, it's like, it seems to me like the, the police as a, as a whole have just gone, you know, that, that whole just a few bad apples argument, it, it, it holds less weight at this moment than I think it could have ever held before. Not that I, not that I ever felt like it held that much weight before, but now it's like, all right, where, where are the, where are the fresh fruit? It's, it's all rotten, it seems to me, or mostly rotten, you know. Yeah, because I, I feel like if you're if you're being tasked to protect and serve, protect the innocent and serve the public trust, you should be held accountable. And I feel like we don't have any accountability right now. That is correct. For us, oh, go ahead. And it's and, it, and it's just not right now. It's only right now because of what you've seen. Just imagine how many have been killed and you haven't seen it. So um, it is definitely the accountability piece where 
uh, the officers have a script they follow. And for every incident, uh, it's the same script that they use. Either, you know, uh, I fear for my life. He was uh, reaching in his waistband, thought he had a gun. Uh, he was resisting arrest. Uh, and then once they try to use one of those excuses of why they shot the person, um, then the media comes back and starts um, demonizing that particular person, you know, which is totally unacceptable, you know, because whatever that person did, that person, uh, that officer didn't know. And not only did the officer know, that person wasn't doing that at that particular time. I'm shocked with how, um, you know, as a liberal, like, the opinion is that Fox is, is, is bad and, you know, some of those outlets are bad. But I'm shocked how the liberal media was focusing so much on the looting. It's like if the show was an hour long, 30 minutes was on the looting and the other 30 was on the peaceful protest. And it's like if the liberal media is do is doing that, like most people who are just sitting in their couch are going to, you know, they're going to focus on the protesting. On the, sorry, on the on the looting. And it's like. I don't know. It feels like brainwashing to me. Yeah. We should expect what? better yeah. from our journalists across the board, I think. And we're not getting that, which is partially why, you know, we exist here. But, you know, not to toot our own horns, but it just it it worries me, um, the state of our media and, and the state of everything. And it's just something else. What? If if another thing I wanted to touch on that I I, I was waiting to you know because one of the things that I I saw on your website on the Oscar Grant Foundation is that you guys also do uh, scholarships. Okay. Yeah. What is that? What is that? Um, you want to talk about yeah. that a little bit? What, what who is that available for? Um, those graduating from high school who submit a application, an essay, um, a letter of recommendation, a letter from the school that they'll be attending. Um, they have to have a, I think it's 3.0 or 2.0 GPA um, to qualify them. The um, people, the team that's over the scholarships reads over the essays and looks at the grade, they do a scoring and then they make a decision on who is um, the scholarship award winner, recipient winner. Right. It's been great talking to Wanda, you guys. Um, if you want to get involved in any way, you want to donate, you want to participate, you want to be involved with the system or contribute to the system in any way, or if you want to, um, you need help in organizing something, you can uh follow online the oscargrantfoundation.org that's o-s-c-a-r-g r-a-n-t f-o-u-n-d-a-t-i-o-n dot org and you could get information and you can see what events they have going on they have the town hall meetings um phil you got anything um it's been great chatting we, we really with everything going on right now um I think it was really great that we were able to tackle this head on um, and just not pretend like the world isn't on fire right now. So right. Um, this was with, with someone that's in it, that's been in the fire right. herself. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Cause you know, these, yeah, we have fun on here and we, we, we goof around and we talk about silly shit, but when there's serious stuff going on in the world, you, you kind of have to address it and have an open dialogue with people. Cause that's the only way, you're going to change people's minds. It's not going to be through arguing. It's going to be through having a dialogue. So we definitely got to talk about stuff like this when it's going on and just educate ourselves and everyone else. Because that's the only way we're going to bring about change. I agree with that 100%, 10%. And it's, it's just, uh, uh, something that it's, if it's not affecting you, it's easy to look the other way. I think that's one thing that, you know, a lot of us, um, especially in some of the neighborhoods we live in, you know, it's easy to look the other way. 
so I think it's important to, to you know, if you're going to stand for human rights, you got to be in there for all humans, not just some, you know? Yeah. You know, there's, there's, that, there's that old saying, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. Well, doesn't get any better than that. This has been The Voice Party, and we are out. Out. We out.